Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. First, I want to thank everyone for coming out this afternoon. I know that there are three other sessions that you could have went to. In fact, I wanted to go to Madeline Kobe Saltzman's inclusivity talk, uh, but we're scheduled at the same time and she's upstairs. But, um, you know, I can catch the video later, so that's okay. And so I know you could have been elsewhere. And I really appreciate that you're here with me today. Now I'll have ample time for Q&A at the end of this session. So write down your questions as they come up. I will repeat them during, during Q&A and then do my best to answer them. This is a talk for technical leaders. Those of you who are engaged in leading technical teams who are doing engineering or even product management because product management is part of shipping software. Now, how many of you are technical leaders? All right. How many of you aspire to be a technical leader? All right. Well, I think I'll have something for both groups today. Now, I've been a technical leader for almost 20 years, and I've worked at companies as large as Accenture and Deloitte, and as companies as small as startups that you will probably never hear about. And it's a tough role. You have to keep people motivated. You have to deal with complicated problems that no one else has been able to solve. And you also have to deal with constantly conflicting messages. Now, I'm good at what I do, but I spend a lot of time trying to get better. I read a lot of leadership books. In fact, I recently read Radical Candor, a book about how can you as a leader develop and deliver uh, candid feedback. And so I do a lot to keep myself current. I do a lot to try to stay on top of my game when it comes to leadership. But, you know, I'm a history buff. And I've realized that history is an underutilized tool for understanding leadership. A lot of people don't really spend time studying history. I mean, why study real history when there's great fake history like Game of Thrones? <laughs> but history has a wealth of leadership lessons that we can use that we won't find in most leadership books. History lets us see the condition, the conditions under which leadership operates. So we're gonna talk about a technical leader from history. And this technical leader had a really tough project. And we'll learn lessons that I think everyone in here can apply to their own leadership style and the daily work you do as a technical leader. That technical leader was named John P. Parker, and his development team was in trouble. He was the lead for something called Project Phoenix, and the, the morale of the 10 people on that project was really low. Someone had just left the team, and the original technical lead for this project uh, had gone. And so despite a reduction in scope, the team was racing towards the finish line to get done. Does that sound familiar to anyone in here? And even though the finish line was literally in sight, Project Phoenix was in danger of not finishing the release and making it into production. Now, John P. Parker wasn't a technical leader in the sense that most of you are. He wasn't leading a software development team building some application that would be used over the network of the internet. But he was operating on a network. It was a network that operated in the 18th and 19th centuries. And this was a period when slavery uh, was legal and strongly protected in the United States. And this protection existed at the federal, I mean in the Constitution, and at the state level. So it was this powerful force uh, that was enforcing and regulating the sale of human people in this country. And it's a period that has a wealth of leadership lessons for us today. Now, I believe that if, if we can understand this period in history, then we'll be better able to lead in the present. But I know that this is hard history. It's hard for most people to discuss. It's hard for most people to, to even think about. But hard history is important to examine because that's the only way to keep it from happening again. And part of living is understanding the dark side of life. Part of living is understand the mistakes that people made in the past to make sure that we don't continue those mistakes into the present. And history repeats itself, or as Mark Twain says, it rhymes with itself. And if we're going to stop, 
uh, this repetitious disharmony in our history, then we have to develop, develop a collective memory of the unpleasant aspects of our past so that we can resist the forces that are trying to make us go backwards. By leaning into hard history, I think that there are a lot of benefits. One, you'll develop a real intuition for when things are heading in a, in a direction that they shouldn't go. You also have a competitive advantage over people who have not taken the time to learn the hard lessons of history. And you also improve your ability to deal with things that are unpleasant. And that will reduce the procrastination that we often have, have when we have to deal with things that are unpleasant to us. Now, I'm sure that many of you work in code bases that have large and complicated histories. And these code bases are things that you probably don't like exploring very often. There might be some, these huge giant classes that you know should be broken up. There might be even entire lines of code that you know you need to just refactor and get rid of. But if you take the time to examine those problematic lines of code, I think you'll find that there's a lot to learn from that code, no matter how dysfunctional it could be. And I think that you'll take what you learn from looking at that bad code and find ways to write better new code. And I think that examining the lines of history is very similar to that. I think that despite the discomfort, it's very useful. Now, to understand John P. Parker and the leadership lessons that he has to share with us, we have to understand the Underground Railroad. First, it was neither underground nor was it a railroad. It was underground in the sense that it was secret. And this was a secrecy that was required by something that operated in a system that had enormous legal, uh, cultural, and even religious protection. It was a railroad in the sense that it took terminology uh, from the high-tech ride-sharing service of its day, the railroad. Uh, before there was Uber, there was the railroad. And so they took the terminology of the railroad, which was high-tech for its time, and they applied it to their network. They applied high-tech terminology to technology. And you may think, well, that's kind of weird that they would do that, but we do this today. The agile practice that's called scrum, that's taken from a play in rugby. Or sprints, which many of you know about today if you're agile, that's taken from, that is taken from track and field. Now, I don't know if any of these athletes do react or angular or view, but every day, people work using terminology taken from their field. And so the software industry has always borrowed terminology from outside the industry to better understand how we describe the work that we do. In a similar fashion, the operatives of the Underground Railroad took railroad uh, terminology and used it to describe their network. So what was the Underground Railroad? It was a network but it was also a system of pathways and people that provided a way for enslaved people to escape from non-slave states into free states or even to Canada or Europe where slavery was illegal. And so this secret network stretched from Boston to Austin and it was composed of self-organizing teams that were operating under conditions of, of extreme uncertainty. And they were tasked with shipping the most important release of all freedom. Now, the 1860 census, which was taken at the height of the Underground Railroad's operations, listed the number of enslaved people in the United States at 3.2 million people. 1850, 3.2 million people were under legal enslavement in this country. Does it include California? Because California wasn't part of the United States, so you all are off the hook. Um, and so these people were held against their will uh, in a social and economic system uh, that exploited and monetized their free label. And their so-called owners had extreme control over what they did. They could control where they went, they can control who they married, or maybe even not let them get married at all. And so the, they had absolute power because the Constitution gave it to them. And it was the mission of the Underground Railroad to help as many of these enslaved people uh, escape their freedom. And the Underground Railroad was structured in a way that is surprisingly close to how we build software today. Can you believe that? How we build software has parallels to how the Underground Railroad operates. You don't believe me? Let's take a look. 
So this is a picture of the, of the Underground Railroad. It's an imagined setting. But if you look at the picture, you'll see the different terminology under which the Underground Railroad worked. Right, you have stations. So that house on the left is a station. And that was a safe house that often provided protection for the people as they went through the Underground Railroad. And this safe house could be a house, or it could be a field, or it could be a cave. Uh, it could be anything that was owned by someone who was operating on the Underground Railroad network. And so stations often had food or they had clothing because often, if you were escaping from the South, you had never gone through a, a northern winter. And so you, you usually weren't dressed for that kind of cold. And so they were able to get clothing to stay warm. Now, you also have um, the station masters. And so those are the people on the right, the person waving on the right-hand side. They were the people who ran the stations. And they would often uh, own the homes that would contain the stations. And uh, it made sh the station masters also, also made sure that information would flow uh, throughout the network. So when you got to the station, the station masters always had the latest details of what was going on in the network. Then you had stockholders, and those are the people, the gentleman with the white black bag over his shoulder and the lady with the blue dress and their two children. Stockholders donated food and clothing to make sure that the stations were stocked. Uh, then you had travelers, the people on the left going to the cave. Those are people that are going on the Underground Railroad. Uh, they're fleeing enslavement and braving enormous risk to get to freedom. And then, of course, you have conductors, and those are the people who are in the middle uh, these are the people who guide the travelers on the Underground Railroad from station to station and eventually into freedom. And that's exactly how we build software today, right? So I found this totally random picture of software developers on the internet, and I'm going to show you how this links exactly to what I just described. I don't know if you've seen this picture before, but you have software development, right? You have a software development team, and you have stockholders. The guy on the right, He's a stockholder, clearly. He's a person who provides funding for the organization. They usually look stoned, but they're, they're, they're stockholders. They're the people who fund the organization. The person going to the left uh, next to him uh, clearly runs the station and is a station master. These are people who usually COOs. Uh, they basically make sure that the team has places to work. They make sure that they have pencils, MacBooks, et cetera, right? Uh, the conductor in the middle clearly is there to make sure that the travelers on the network do what they need to do, and he leads them to their freedom of software releases. And then we have the person, uh, the two people on the far left, of course, those are the travelers. Those are the people who do the real work of getting things done. So clearly, software development today is structured exactly like the Underground Railroad 100 years ago. Now, you may be unconvinced. You're like, that? No, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. The software development has nothing to do with how the Underground Railroad operated. Well, take a look at this picture. This is a, just a common diagram of how software is built today, right? You have a team typically working at the client site. There might be a small group who are there building product. They hand it off and they go across the border, sometimes to an offshore team, maybe in India, perhaps in Russia, maybe in the Philippines, and then that product eventually gets to the release. It gets to the end customer. So if I rotate this a little bit and then overlay the map, you'll see a similar operation, right? Software goes from the on-site location, offshore, uh, and then gets released to production, right? And isn't that how you experience building software, uh, navigating through slave territory to get the freedom? That's, that's, maybe that's why we call it a release. It's freedom. So that's how the Underground Railroad really has parallels uh, today. Now, I could tell you so many stories about this network. I can tell you about this gentleman uh, named Henry Box Brown, who was a slave who literally put himself into a box and mailed himself to freedom. And over a, a two-day journey, the box flipped, and it was in a hot hole of a ship of a steamer. And he almost passed out many times, but he finally got to where he, was, he wanted to get into a free state, and he emerged a free person. Or I could tell you about this couple here, uh, William and Ellen Kraft. Now, this was a married couple, uh, but they were enslaved. And so uh, Ellen was light enough to pass for a white person. 
But William, let's say he was 24 karat black. He was really, really a black person. But they hashed up a plan that they would travel in disguise. So the, the, the wife would dress up and pretend to be a white person traveling with William, her servant. All right. Now, how's that for, for marital therapy? Uh, you know, I think my wife and I should actually try this. So they traveled by rail and by boat, and they eventually made their way to the free states and eventually settled in England. In fact, a lot of, a lot of escapes, escaped enslaved people landed in Canada, and they also landed in the UK. And a lot of the people of color in those countries, um, they actually got there, or their ancestors did, because they were fleeing captivity in the United States. But we're here to talk about John P. Parker. Now, John P. Parker, I think, has a lot of great leadership lessons for us to learn. Now, John P. Parker was born into slavery because his mother was a slave. By law, he was automatically a slave. That's how it worked. And I think that it did not take John P. Parker long to begin to hate the institution of slavery. When he was eight, he was chained to an older man and forced to walk 100 miles from Norfolk, uh, Virginia to Mobile, Alabama. So if you can imagine how far that is, um, you would imagine that he would not like the experience that he was eventually sold to a doctor. And although it was illegal to teach enslaved people to read, the doctor's sons decided to teach John P. Parker uh, how to read and write. Now, John P. Parker spent most of his teen years trying to unsuccessfully escape from, from, from being enslaved. Uh, he tried multiple times to get away. He was always, ca he was always caught. But he eventually learned uh, the trade of metalworking, uh, which allowed him uh, to, to make money. And he eventually was hired out to uh, one of the doctor's patients, and he said, look, I will work for you uh, in exchange for my freedom. And so he eventually settled down in Ripley, Ohio. Ripley, Ohio is a very important part of this lesson. Uh, anyone in from Ohio in the room? All right, whereabouts, Cincinnati? Uh, no, opposite side of the state. Okay, there you go. So have you heard of Ripley? Okay, Ripley's not far from Cincinnati. So he settled in Ripley, and Ohio was a free state, and so he actually opened up an iron foundry. And he became an inventor. He's actually one of the first black Americans to patent his inventions. And he became one of the wealthiest men in Ohio at the time. Now, Parker found uh, that he found a career in Ripley, but he also found a cause. Now, there was a very strong anti-slavery movement uh, in Ripley, and Parker, almost by accident, began helping slaves uh, on the Underground Railroad. Now, Parker changed from a wealthy industrious who lived a double life, right? So he would run his foundry by day, and then every night he would go out and go across the river over into slave territory, risking his own freedom uh, in order to help people uh, get out uh, from slavery. Now, I know it's a strange concept, right? This wealthy uh, man who's a vigilante by night. I know we've never heard of that before. <laughs> kind of hard to grok. Uh, but that was uh, John P. Parker. And, you know, we may also think it's weird that this brilliant inventor who works in iron uh, begins to help humanity. I know that's kind of a weird concept. But this was John P. Parker. Uh, he risked his life over and over again to help his teams be successful. And I think that it was because he hated slavery so much that he would risk his life um, over and over again. And he, the number of people that he would help started out to be two, then 10, and eventually he helped hundreds of people flee from the southern states to freedom in the free states. Uh, but Project Phoenix, which is what we're gonna talk about today, was one of his toughest projects. And we'll go into a lot of leadership lessons to how this technical leader helped his team get to freedom. Now, Parker's involvement in Project Phoenix, Phoenix started the way uh, that a lot of technical leaders got involved in, get involved in projects. Uh, it was a project that was in trouble. Now, it began in central Kentucky, uh, which is where uh, 10 state people were fleeing captivity uh, to get to freedom. And they had an initial technical leader who was leading them. But that technical leader was, was eventually caught uh, by the people who were chasing them. And so they started the project in central uh, Kentucky, uh, and they made it all the way to the Ohio River without their leader because that person uh, was actually captured. And so as you might expect, uh, this had an immediate negative impact on the team's velocity. 
those of you who do agile understand the, ter the, t the uh, velocity uh, term. And so they stopped making progress and they completely stopped uh, deep in the dangerous territory that's called the borderland. That was what it was called. Now, uh, the, the borderland area, which we should zoom into, was a section that was composed of uh, Kentucky in the north, I'm sorry, Kentucky in the south, and Ohio in the north. And so it was separated by the Ohio River. Now, the edge of the borderland north of the Ohio River uh, was where the free people who were working on the Underground Railroad uh, were operating. But south of the Ohio River was the borderland, and it stretched all the way down to the south. And during this period, even though it was extremely dangerous, almost every night an enslaved person tried to go through the borderland to escape to freedom. And most of them were caught. Uh, they were caught and either killed or they were, they were sold back down south, far away from the border, uh, to go back to their lives of enslavement. And, you know, escaping through the borderland would have been impossible without the Underground Railroad. It would have been impossible if people didn't risk their own freedom to help others get to freedom. And so this area was constantly patrolled by slave hunters. Uh, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 provided wide incentives for people to go into the borderland and even into the free, the free states in order to capture people who were escaped. Uh, it was so bad that there was something called the reverse Underground Railroad, where you can go into a free state and say, oh, that's my escaped slave, and you had never seen them before, and I could take you back with me into the slave states. It was horrible. And so Parker would eventually even get a $1,000 bounty on his head because he was so well known for being someone who operated on the Underground Railroad. Now, if we go into, let's zoom in on the Ripley area. I remember I said Ripley, Ohio was a very important part of this story. Now, the Phoenix team was deep in the borderland. And so their plight began to spread through the network of the Underground Railroad. Different station masters began to hear about this and eventually got uh, to Ripley. And a former slave took a boat from the Kentucky side over the river to Ohio, and he went to find help and he went to the house of, st of Station Master Tom Collins, who was actually a, a white man. Uh, he went at night and told them about the Project Phoenix team. And these two men went to uh, John P. Parker's house, and as you do, he said, I'm going to go rescue these people who were trapped on the other side of the river. And so he uh, put two pistols into his belt uh, and a knife into his pocket, uh, just in case he had to handle any emergencies. Now, um, Parker packed these two pistols, and I'm from Texas, and I would never say that you should arm yourself before you go talk to your technical team. Um, but this is 170 years ago. These were rough times, and, uh, and so Parker was, you know, packing that heat. And so we'll see his pistols again in the story, uh, but think of them as incentives. Think of Parker's pistols as incentives, which leads us to our first leadership lesson. Prepare your incentives before you need them. Prepare your incentives before you need them. A good technical leader always has incentives packed away for emergency purposes. Now, how do you incentivize software developers? And this is going to vary from company to company and team to team, uh, but I prefer incentives that reward team performance, not just individuals, but team performance, uh, and that are based on really the only one truly non-renewable resource, time. I always try to make sure that I reward my team uh, for whatever they do uh, by giving them more time. So I may give them more time to work on a project of their choosing. So let's say we finish a project early. I'll say, you know what? If you have any pet projects or a GitHub repo, if you're an open source software, just spend the rest of this sprint working on that. So I always like to give the team time uh, to work on their, their projects. And this is a great incentive after you reach a really big milestone. Or, you know what, I'm going to go talk to management and I'm going to get some funding for books or to go to conferences or to go to events like this so that you can develop yourself. And so I always like to wrap my incentives around time or funding for my development team to make better use of their time to make themselves more valuable. Not just to me or to the company, but valuable based on what they want to do in their career. 
Now the key thing here is to have a portfolio of incentives because people are going to vary in how they respond to incentives. A lot of uh, technical leaders that I know always want to go out for drinks. They always want to go out, let's go to happy hour, let's go have some drinks, let's go celebrate. But what about that single mother on your, on your team uh, who just wants to go home and spend time with her children and not you know, pay so much for babysitting? Uh, why not give her a gift card and let her spend time with her family instead of always dragging her to the bar with the rest of the team? So have a portfolio of incentives so you can tailor those incentives to the members of your team and really find their utility function and really get to the heart of what they value. Now Parker and the former uh, slave uh, took the boat uh, back across the Ohio River and because it was about to become daytime, uh, they had to stop. Now I want to reiterate the danger that these two people were in. They could have been captured, uh, they could have been caught by one of the random patrols that always were going through this area looking for escaped slaves or the people who would help them. Uh, and at worst, they could have been captured and then brought back into slavery. So John P. Parker, who was a free man, could become a slave. Uh, or at worst, they could have been killed because the bounty on Parker's head was dead or alive. We don't care. Get this man out of the operations of the, of the Underground Railroad. And so they went to a cabin of a slave uh, who would eventually lead Parker to the Phoenix team. Uh, but it was almost daytime, so Parker hid in the woods until midnight. So when the sun set, uh, Parker and the guy went to the team's location in the borderland. Uh, and so even though this team, this Project Phoenix team had been well stocked, they had been given food by various friends, so they weren't starving, they had plenty to drink, but they were very demor demoralized. Uh, in fact, the, you know, they, they had seen their previous technical leader captured. Um, they were really afraid because they were afraid that, you know, we're out here without a leader. And they felt that they were rudderless and they had no direction. In fact, a lot of the members of the Project Phoenix team said, you know what, let's just quit. Let's just give ourselves up and go back into slavery. So Parker knew that decisive action would be critical to get this team ready to go. So he says, let's move out. But then he runs into a problem. One of the men on the team, one of the 10 people in this group, one of the 10 members of the Project Finish teams begins to complain. And he's complaining loudly. So uh, what did Parker do? He used one of his incentives. He pulled out his pistol and he said, you know what? You can either come with us or you can be shot. Which immediately quieted the man down and got him underneath Parker's control. Please don't shoot any of your team members. I'm not saying that. Uh, so let's translate what Parker did into uh, the elegant weapons we have in the civilized age that we live in today, which leads us to our next leadership lesson. Bold actions set the tone. Bold actions set the tone. Whenever you're joining a new team as their technical leader or you're with the team that you've led before, uh, but you might be doing a new project, Everyone's going to begin to assess you uh, based on your early moves. What you do early on will determine how they respect you. It will determine how they will respond to you. And those assessments are going to last for a long time. It's really hard to overcome the first impressions that you give to people. So you have to make sure that those early hours with your new team and that those early days are used very, very well. Now, I've served as a scrum master to many companies, and I've walked in on the first day to figure out what's happening with this team. And more than once, I've walked into the, the daily stand-up, which was in a conference room where everyone was sitting down. And the meeting lasted for like an hour. And I was like, what is this? And so I would get to work the next day really early, and I would move all the chairs out of the conference room into the hallway. And I would stand in this room that now had no chairs, and I would wait. And so the first person would come in, and they would look at me very weird, and then they would just stand next to me. And the next person would come in, and they would stand next to that person. And eventually, uh, the entire team began to understand, we stand doing stand-ups. That's why they're called daily stand-ups. And so by doing that, by making that bold move, that helped me get our stand-ups from a scrum anti-patron to something that was actually useful. So my bold action set the tone. And of course, I explained the theory behind the stand-ups. 
We don't stand up just to stand up. Standing up helps the meeting go faster. It helps us focus on answering the questions that we ask during daily stand-ups, which is, what did I do since the last stand-up? What will I do today? And then what's uh, in my way? What are the impediments? And then we work together to put that plan together and then to remove the impediments blocking the team's progress. And so that's the lightweight plan that is the reason why we have daily stand-ups. And we can create that lightweight plan usually within five minutes for a team of 10 and get back to work. But Parker didn't have time to explain the theory behind what he was doing, uh, but his actions were effective. Now, Parker knew that the Phoenix team couldn't, could not use the roads uh, because they were heavily patrolled. But he realized that there were these wooded areas next to the road. And so he began to lead his team uh, through the road. And so they began going through uh, the thick woods. And so it was tough. It's exhausting work. These aren't, you know, th these aren't cleared pathways through the forest. They're really thick foliage. And so um, it's hard work, but because they were covered, uh, they could travel during the day. Most people on the ground railroad had to travel at nighttime. So they had the advantage of traveling during the day. But Parker had another problem. So Parker was a very experienced conductor on the Underground Railroad. He was an accomplished woods person, so he was able to go through the forest pretty easily. But the people with them, not so much. Uh, they were going through the brush, crackling uh, branches, uh, making a loud noise, and doing everything that you're not supposed to do if you're trying to move in a stealthy manner. And so the team began to get demoralized again because they saw that they weren't making very much progress. And so the noise of their movement really began to get louder and louder. Now, many of you may, be, may find that's a familiar thing, right? You're leading a team, they're going through thick woods, there's a lot of noise. This team was basically going through the 19th century version of JavaScript, right? <laughs> uh, which leads us to our next leadership lesson. Don't let your experience bias you. Many of you lead development teams where you have a lot of control over the stack. You can say, you know what, I have a lot of experience uh, with React, but Vue might be a better JavaScript framework to use. Um, or maybe you've done a lot of work with AWS, but actually Google Cloud is more fit for purpose. So it's very important that you align what you do and the decisions you make as a technical leader with the needs of the team, with the work that they're engaged in. And so you want to make sure that you're always thinking about that. So don't let your preferences blind you to what's best for the team. You may have to choose from aligning with your expertise to aligning with what's best for the team. And often when you do that, the team's going to flourish. That's what happened with Project Phoenix. Parker realized that if they went into the ravines instead of the forest, then by going through the ravines where there was moss-covered rocks and soft ground, they made more progress. And so the team realized that, wow, this is a lot easier than going through all the brush that we were going through. We're, we're making a lot more progress. Parker basically converted his team from JavaScript to TypeScript. So realizing their new competence, they began to get joyful. And so they began to move through the borderland uh, with hope. Now, there was another problem that Parker encountered. And one of the single men uh, who wasn't married on the team uh, began thir uh, got thirsty. Uh, and this single man decided to go looking through the forest for water. Now Parker very much admonished this man, don't go off by yourself, but uh, he decided to go out on his own. You know, what is it with single men? Can you tell me, Lizzie, I mean, single men, you know, always going off on their own. Uh, I've been married for 16 years and, you know, married men live longer than single men and we, we usually know why. So this thirsty single man goes out on his own to find um, water, and, and then Parker just begins to move the group forward because he knows that we can't wait for this guy to, to come back. But then just a few minutes later, they hear this thirsty guy running through the forest, and he's racing through the brush, and they see that he's being chased by two slave hunters. So the team gets down because Parker realizes that even though this guy's in trouble, he can't risk his team to save him. And so while this man is running, he, Parker looks around and he sees that members of the group are getting, are looking nervous. And he realizes that if any of them yell out or if any of them try to help this person 
who's being chased by these slave catchers who went off on his own, then that's going to jeopardize all of them. So what did Parker do again? He put out his incentive, put out his pistol, and he said, if any of you all run, I will shoot you on the spot. And so the team quieted down. And, and this was really important because Parker did not want the actions of one or two people to jeopardize the entire group. As a technical leader, there are times where you have to realize that one or two people could easily derail everyone else. And you often have to be very decisive in how you handle that. So you may think, and man, Parker was really quick with the pistols. He really was quick to draw them. And um, you, know, you may know that this was not the first time that Parker had to use his pistols. This was a similar problem, and that's the next leadership lesson. You have to embrace continuous solving. As a technical leader, you're probably going to be surprised by how often problems reoccur or that similar problems keep happening. And most of the problems that we deal with as leads are, are chronic. Um, they're often tied to the technology we choose to use. Uh, they're also tied to the culture that we work in. And so teams are just like code bases. They're constantly changing. Technology changes, leadership changes, uh, competitors change. And just like code, a change can often break things. You know, that's why we regression test. And so you have to constantly realize that there's going to always be problems that you have to solve. You have to continually solve problems and you're going to probably run into the same problem more than once. You know, I've often found that after I fix the stand-ups that are happening with my teams, I have to go into some other meeting problem. You know, a common complaint about Scrum is that, wow, there are too many meetings. And usually, it's not that there are too many meetings, but that there's a broken meeting culture at this company. Everyone, in, anyone ever worked in a broken meeting culture where meetings are, they go on forever, there's no agenda, you come to the meeting, you don't know why you're there, you leave the meeting, you don't know what was accomplished. Those are chronic problems that people point to Scrum to blame, but the problem goes a lot deeper. So it's very important that we get used to continuous solving because I make my way upstream to figure out how can I help this organization fix their broken meeting culture, which will usually help them understand why Scrum is a very useful way to, 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 to build software. And it's often true that, that problems don't die. Only people do. So be kind to your people and work with them to solve problems. By the way, if you're ever on an interview and someone ask you about how you solve problems, don't say problems, uh, people, you know, problems don't die, people do. It's kind of dark. Um, but we're at True University where, where we keep it real, so uh, I can't lie to you. But the good news is that if you have a portfolio of incentives and a portfolio of problem solving tools, uh, then you'll be better prepared for continuous solving. So keep that portfolio well stocked. Now, the Phoenix team uh, heard rustling uh, in, in, in the bush because they were laying down, and they eventually saw that man, that thirsty single guy, being led away with the rope around his neck and the two slave catchers uh, walking behind him. And they realized that, or Parker realized, that this guy is a lost cause. There's nothing that we can do for him. And so Parker realized that his team was now in very, very deep danger um, of being captured. They had narrowly escaped being captured with this incident. But he realized that this captured member, this captured former member of the team uh, may tell the people who had captured him that he was not alone in the borderland. So Parker decided to get the team as far away from that spot as possible. Uh, and so they began to travel through the borderland. They had to leave that spot and they eventually come to a road. But this road is, well, is too well traveled. There's often horses going by, there's carriages going by, and he realizes that we can't uh, cross it during the day. We have to wait till nightfall. So he has the team wait until nightfall. So after dark, they, they cross the road uh, and they begin the last leg of their journey toward freedom. The, the Ohio River was beginning to become in sight, so let's go ahead and zoom into that area. And let's talk about they're finally within sight of Ripley. Uh, Ripley symbolized freedom. And so there was like freedom shining in the night. And so the team began to slowly make their way uh, towards the river. But uh, as they go toward the river, they encounter someone on patrol. Uh, this patrol person suddenly appears out of nowhere. And this person sees the number of people that are with Jumpy Parker. And so he runs off. 
Uh, but John P. Parker realizes that, okay, now we really have to be careful because this person is going to tell everyone that we're here. And so because Parker had traveled during the day, uh, most people thought that he wouldn't get there much later. So Parker was basically 24 hours ahead of schedule. Uh, you know, it's almost like realizing that, you know, I'm going to check in my code and have my weekend and then the DevOps team is taking down the server. Same thing. Uh, he got in there so early that there was no provision for him to get across the river. Uh, so he had the team hunker down and wait. Um, now we're back where we started this story. The team is scared. Their first leader had been captured. They recently had someone lead the team. They're in mortal danger of losing this entire project. Uh, they were rushing around trying to figure out what to do, uh, but failure seemed imminent. But then eventually they get up and they begin looking for a boat and then someone finds a boat and then they realize that there are no oars in the boat. And so they realize that, well, this is a boat, but without oars, what's it going to do for us? And so Parker begins to have the team stomp through the grass and try to find an oar, uh, but they don't find one. And soon they hear the barking of hounds and they realize that the pursuers are going to imminently begin to swarm them. And you know, that obviously that patrol person that they met was a C++ developer because he ran really fast. <laughs> so Parker leaps into the boat and he's gonna try to just rip a, a chair out of the boat and use that as an oar. And then when he does that, he realizes that, oh, there's an oar in the boat. They just couldn't see it because it was so dark. And so Parker, uh, as the sounds of pursuers are growing, uh, he begins to pile the team into the boat. Uh, and so there's only one problem. This boat could only carry nine members of the 10 people who were on the team. So there's a person uh, who's left on the shore who won't fit in the boat. And so the problem is that this person on the shore, uh, his wife was on the boat. And so Parker is just waiting and thinking, what can we do? I have to leave now, but if I leave, then this woman's husband is gonna be left behind. And so Parker uh, had to learn the final leadership lesson we're going to go over today. And that's if you're a technical lead, you are a leader of leader, a leader of leaders. You're a leader of leaders. Now, often when you're a technical lead, you're, you think, well, I have the title. I have the say so. And we think that, you know, it's on us to solve everything. But we have to realize that despite all of our boldness, despite all of our incentives, despite all of our solutions, we can't solve everything. You're not the only leader on your team. You may have the title, uh, but you have to trust that the members of your team will come through for you when you don't know what to do. Leaders often think that it's on them, right? We think it's on us to solve things. You know, we, we think, we tell ourselves, I alone can fix it. We think that every solution that comes up, if I did not do it, then I'm not really being a leader. But that's just the myth of the solo inventor. You know, we use solutions every day that we did not invent. Did you invent language? Did you invent reading and writing? Did you even make the clothes you're wearing right now? We use solutions every day that we don't make. That does not make them any less useful, nor, do we how we use, nor, nor does how we use them make us less leaders. And so we have to trust uh, that the people on our team will lead with us. Uh, even, even Edison worked in a lab with assistants who helped him to create the light bulb. And that's the way that leadership works. We have to work with our team to lead the team. So what happened? One of the single men on the boat got out of the boat, walked back to shore, and let the husband get onto the boat. He sacrificed himself so that the greater good of the group could happen. He gave up his freedom so that everyone could become free. And so Parker begins rolling, rolling across the Ohio River to get away from the slave catchers. And as he does, he looks back and he eventually sees lights surround the man on the shore and he ultimately was recaptured. So Parker took his team to Tom's, Tom Collins' house and he was surprised because he didn't expect them to work that, that quickly. Parker drops off the team with Tom Collins. Eventually another conductor takes the team to freedom in Canada and Parker never sees his team again. 
Now, Parker was one of many former enslaved people who risked his life over and over again on the Underground Railroad. And I hope that you've learned a lot of leadership lessons from his life, but I also want to share with you the characteristics that were vital for the Underground Railroad to be successful because I think that these characteristics are vital for technical leaders today to be successful. The first characteristic was not to feel failure. If you're operating on the Underground Railroad, one mistake could cost you your freedom, one mistake could cost you your life. But the people in this network did it anyway. They chose to do the work despite the risk because it was the right thing to do. And you, all may, you may think that, you know, I'm a technical leader, but what if I make the wrong decision? Or what if my team do doesn't like me? You can't let those fears hold you back. You're going to make mistakes, but mistakes are part of building software, right? We have to be willing to get it wrong a thousand times in order to get it right once. That's the business of building software. That's the business of leading teams. The second core characteristic of the Underground Railroad was courage. You can fight an oppressive system if you have the courage to do so. The Underground Railroad operated in an environment of extreme oppression. Slavery, literally human trafficking, was legal in the United States. It was protected by the Constitution. This Fugitive Slave Act gave people enormous power over enslaved people trying to get to freedom. And helping people on the Underground Railroad often required breaking the law. But the people did it because they knew that the law of human dignity always outweighs any unjust laws that people come up with. And so they had the courage to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Now like Parker, um, a lot of the people in the Ground Railroad had regular day jobs. Uh, he, had a, he had a business to run. Uh, he had inventions to make. But he risked his life to help people even though that wasn't part of his job description. And many of us have jobs. We work in technology uh, and doing things like ending the toxic culture. That's often a big part of the technology industry. That's not in our job descriptions. And, you know, this culture can be very sickening. Uh, not too long ago, there was a woman who said that he came, she came to work and this guy was hiding under her desk. You may have read, re, you know, read that story. Uh, the culture of technology can be really toxic. And it may be hard to change it. It may be risky to change it. But we should do it because it's, it's right. And sometimes we have to break policies in order to do that. Operating the Underground Railroad also required the characteristic of empathy. Many people thought that slavery was evil. A lot of people thought, even people who owned slaves thought that slavery was evil. Uh, but a lot of people did not have what it takes to think about, how can I be empathetic in this situation? And because of all the legal things that were going on, they would always ask themselves, well, if I help free these enslaved people, what will happen to me? What's going to happen to what I care about? But empathy changes that question to, if I don't help free these enslaved people, what will happen to them? And operating with empathy and technology means that, you know what, if I help marginalized people in tech, if I help the women in tech, we had a great panel uh, yesterday about women working in technology and often the challenges that women face in this field. We may think, well, if I help women or people of color in tech, what's going to happen to me? But if we're empathetic, we're going to say, if I don't help these marginalized people, what's going to happen to them? Now, people think that slavery ended on January 1st in 1863 when Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation became law, or maybe when the 13th Amendment uh, became law later. But neither of those events really ended slavery. Slavery ended when that first unknown slave took that first tentative step on the Underground Railroad. And it continued to end with every enslaved person who followed that first tentative step. Now the challenges in our industry, the challenges in technology that we have, whether they're technical or cultural, they're not going to be ended overnight. But they also won't be ended by any federal law or any corporate policy. There's no HR department who's going to solve this problem. To end the problems that we have, many of those problems are going to require technical leadership. 
and it's going to require people who will take a step and take a stand to do what's right. I'm a solution owner at Slalom, and every day I'm in a meeting with some usually multi-billion dollar company trying to figure out how I and my team can solve their problems. And you know, every day when I'm in that meeting, a little bit of the Underground Railroad is in the meeting with me. It informs my decisions, it informs the respect I give to my team, it informs uh, how I approach problems. It's part of my leadership style. Now, very few leadership talks draw from slavery, as you probably know, and you may think that your background doesn't have a lot to do uh, with what you do today leading technical teams. In fact, I, and I'm the descendant of enslaved people, and I for a long time thought that that history had nothing to do uh, with what I do as a leader. But knowing that people like John P. Parker existed and they resisted, I mean, the resistance was strong, y'all. Knowing that, he, that people like him fought back against overwhelming odds, that inspires me to be a better leader. Because I don't ever work with stakes that high. If I make a mistake, I'm not going to be sold into slavery. Well, I hope not. You know, I'm not going to be killed, hopefully. But if they could operate under stakes that high, then I can surely operate under the parameters of my job. Surely I can take a chance and take a risk in order to do what's right. And you may not have grown up in Silicon Valley. You may not work for a company that has been funded with billions of dollars. You may not have access to all the latest technologies and tools. You may have gone to an Ivy League school like Harvard or MIT or Stanford. But the early experiences that formed you, the background that you grew up in, the history of the people that you come from, I really believe that they're worth examining. And that as you look for guidance on how to lead your teams, I challenge you to look at your own history. I challenge you to bring your authentic self to the teams that you lead. Add the authenticity of your race, of your gender, of even who you love to how you do your job. You'll be a better leader for it, and I think that your teams will enjoy the experience as well. So don't be afraid to apply the little known leadership lessons of history and of other cultures and other times in, in, uh, in the world to how you lead your teams. Don't be afraid to comb through your history. Don't be afraid to bring who you truly are to what you do. And I think the Underground Railroad is a great place to start. Thank you. All right, how am I doing with time? Uh, you have like five or seven minutes of questions. Okay, so Q&A, let's open it up. I usually, one, one if you have a question, ra raise your hand. Any questions? Okay, let's start over here. What's your name? Aubrey. Hello, Aubrey. Hi, nice to meet you. Great, so Aubrey's asking what are the top three, and I'll go with three, sure. uh, uh, characteristics of the technical leaders that I've been around. And I've been fortunate to work at technical leader, with technical leaders from Accenture, Deloitte, lots of startups, Slalom. And I would say that if I had to name three characteristics, I would say one is technical competence. You have to know the work to lead the work. And so your team will respect you if they know that you know how to build software. So technical competence is number one. You don't get in the door without that. I also say that communication is really important. You have to be able to communicate the direction to your team. Here's where we're going. Here's why we're going. Here's how we're going to get there. Those are key things that you have to do in order to effectively get a technical team to deliver against all the constraints that we encounter uh, in building software. And I, was, and I would finally say empathy. You have to care. People will respect you, people will respond to you far more if they know that you care about them than if they believe that you're just a cog in the machine, another brick in the wall. They'll be able to, you'll get more performance, you'll get better outcomes if you truly care about the people that you're leading than if you don't. And, you know, I read a book on leadership called Leadership, and it described uh, uh, transformational versus transactional leaders, right? Transactional leaders always are, you know, if you do what I say, I will reward you. If you don't do what I say, I will punish you. That's transactional. A transformational leader really is invested in the, in the team, cares about the team, she understands what influences the team, and that's all based on empathy. And so I would say um, technical competence, communication, empathy, yeah. The best have that. Does that help, Aubrey? Yes, 
All right, any other questions? Yes, no, maybe so? Yes, what's your name? I'm sorry? Marsham. Okay, close enough. <laughs> Go ahead. I have a question about compromise. So finding a way to do the compromise with the Yeah. I sometimes face the situation that I am willing to compromise myself yep. within the team, but team members are not willing to compromise from their end. Yeah. Do you have any suggestion for achieve? You know, one the, the, the lesson that I stated about, you know, you're a leader of leaders, if you're a technical leader. I usually give this example, I didn't think it was gonna fit in, but let me just say it real quick. Um, I actually had to have someone bail me out because of compromise. In terms of, well, I was working on a project, actually late last year, and we were going through the latter part of our project, doing the last few sprints, and we realized that, wow, we're not going to really get this done. And by, by, the, by the contractual end of the engagement and the statement of work, and so I go to my, you know, my leadership and I say, well, can we work some overtime? And they actually said no, because we're actually constrained by the contract with how many hours we can charge back to the client. So I'm like, oh, that's kind of a problem. And so I knew that if we did not work more because the schedule wasn't going to change, then we would not be successful. So I brooded over this. And so I eventually just came to the team and I just explained this is the situation how can we solve this? And a big part of compromise is bringing the problem to the team, not trying to figure out in isolation what the compromise is, and then do corporate solving. So we talked about it, and then this is the, the leader on my team who bailed me out, even though I'm the leader of the project. And she said, you know what, I'm just gonna go rogue. I'm gonna work this next couple of weekends, I'm gonna get it done. And don't worry about the overtime, I'm just gonna make sure that, that we get it done. So that was a compromise that I didn't even drive. This person volunteered to do that. Once I shared with the team the situation, the problem, I began to explain the parameters that I thought existed to solve the problem, and this person just did it. And so this, was a, this is how I, or one way I learned the lesson, that I'm a leader of leaders, and something that I couldn't solve was, was, was actually solved by, by someone else. So I would say the best thing to do is don't, don't try to compromise in isolation. Bring it to the team. Uh, help them understand the situation and then involve them in figuring out what compromise works out. And I usually let this person have comp time and I took care of that, uh, but that worked out really well. Yes, what's your name? Benjamin. Benjamin, hi. So Benjamin's asking, I have some members of my team who are really hard workers, they're gonna go at it, in fact, often to their detriment. How do I handle that? So I work in, in agile practices and usually my role is a combination of project master and scrum master and you know, one of the key ways that I explain Scrum Master is that I'm a servant leader. Uh, my job is to lead the team by serving the team. And that usually means that I protect the team from outside forces that try to get to the team. And so I, early on, this is when I get my incentives in place early, is that I go to leadership and I tell them, look, if we're going to be successful, we have to let the team focus. And, I, and I, this takes a lot of time and a lot of meetings, a lot of speeches. And I say that if you need this team, if you need anything from this team, come to me first. I'll go to the team and figure out based on what's in our current sprint, what's on the product backlog, how we're going to address this. But it's really important that you go through me. And I do that through influence, I do that through uh, delivering, because if you have a track record of delivering, you get a lot of runway to have more leeway. And so by doing that, I, I cut off, because a lot of people who are really hyper-productive, who work every weekend, who stay late, leadership knows who those people are. And they're like, oh, I have a pet project, it's gonna be real quick, why don't you help? And so I, I stopped that off. And then I told the team member, look, um, and this is where empathy comes into play, I care about you, I've noticed this, please, if anything comes up that's not in the current sprint, and this is where Scrum is really handy, please let me know, please talk to me first before you start doing it. So I try to cut it off from above, then I try to make sure I work with that team member to understand I'm here to help, and it's really important that we focus on what's in the current sprint, which is, does, does everyone understand sprints and Scrum and Agile? Okay, uh, and that, and, and that um, you know, if it's not in the sprint, it doesn't exist. And so a lot of that is just socialized over time and by modeling, that's how I handle that, by helping someone who's a really hard worker uh, to not work themselves and burn out. 
Does that help? All right. Um, I think I'm out of time. This is the last session. I'm happy to hang out in here. So everyone's free to go. If you need to leave, that's fine. I'm happy to hang out if you want to come up. And I'm going to go to the reception as well later on. So if you see me, talk to me. All right, thank you.